Greetings and salutations and welcome to my video about the EXT4 file system. This video has been many years in the making and some of you have been asking for it for quite a long time so thank you for your patience. What took so long was to figure out how to boil this down into some snackable bites of information because file systems are complex things and when you start digging into them your eyes can just glaze over like I don't know what these people are talking about so the idea here is to give you a very high level look at ext4 how it works and why you should probably care whether you're using it on your system or not ext4 is the default file system for Linux and it is automatically shipped on most Linux distributions. If you are running Debian or Ubuntu or anything based on Debian and Ubuntu, and that's a lot of distributions, they ship with ext4 as the default file system. Arch Linux is default ext4. Manjaro based on Arch is default ext4. There are a couple of distributions these days that do not ship with ext4 and use alternative file systems. We'll talk about that at the end of the video and we'll talk a little bit about why that is. If you are a geek and you know a whole lot about ext4 and other file systems you might find this video a bit simplistic. I had to generalize quite a bit. I have left out some information simply because of the fact that these videos if we were doing file system videos could just go on forever we could just it there's so much to talk about and so much chatter in the forums about them and what file system is best for this and that sort of thing that it could just go on forever at the end of the video when we're talking about the different file systems that Linux can interact with I'm gonna give you my opinions on them and why I continue to stick with ext4 even though it is quite an old file system at this point. It's been around for, well, the EXT file system's been around for quite some time. EXT4 is relatively new. It's been around since 2006. So let's jump right in. What is a file system? That's the first thing that we need to answer. There are actually two definitions of that phrase when you're working with computers. The first could be considered as the high-level file system or the file structure. And that is the directories and the files and how they're laid out on your main hard drive. So if you type ls when you open up a terminal or you type ls with the slash there representing root, it will give you exactly the main file system that you see on your computer. I did a video about that called Learning the Linux File System. And I did the same spiel I'm doing now in that video. It's one of the most popular videos on my channel. So if that's something you want to look at, you can check that out as well. Today we're going to be talking about file storage device software, which could be considered the low-level file system. And in Linux, we got a lot of choices, as you can see on the graphic here. And we're going to talk about those choices at the end. But we're going to concentrate first on ext4. So when you hear somebody talking about file systems, you need to understand the context. Very important. Now let's talk about drives and partitions. And before we get into that, let me tell you, I will interchange both terms for the same thing. I will call a partition a drive and I will call a drive a partition. Because most people consider partitions to be drives and they're usually represented on the system as drives even if you have more than one partition on a single physical device. As far as the system is concerned, it's just a place where it can store data. We're looking at a screenshot of Gparted here, and it's a bit of a blurry one, I'm sorry, but I had to find one that showed the old MS-DOS NBR system because uh, there are two basic partitioning schemes that you're going to find in Linux today. There are more than two that you could choose from, but these are the main ones. And if you have a computer that either has UEFI disabled or it is so old that it does not have UEFI, then chances are when you installed Linux on it, you got a master boot record partition. And it is an MS-DOS compatible master boot record. And it goes back to 
the early 90s. And yes, this is the same technology that Microsoft used with the FAT file system and the FAT32 later on and then NTFS. It's the same deal. It's the reason why you can boot both Linux and Windows off of the same drive. Well, these days, if you have a system that is running UEFI, and that's how it boots, chances are the installer set up a GPT partitioning system, which is a newer partition table that has some advantages over the older MS-DOS partition table. MS-DOS partitions, you can have four primary partitions, and for something to be bootable, it has to be a primary partition. And that's it on a drive. In other words, you can only come up with four spaces. And it's because of how the partition table is actually written to the drive. There's only so much space there. Now, later on, they came up with the idea of extending it so you could have an extended partition. So you could have up to three primary partitions. And you would make your fourth partition extended. And then within that, you could have logical drives or logical partitions in there. And then you could have as many as you wanted or at least up to 26, I believe. But I think you could go on beyond that because, you know, in DOS and Windows, partitions are usually represented by a drive letter, whereas in Linux, it's represented by a mount point. So I'm not really sure what happens if you went beyond 26 logical partitions in an MBR, or even if you could do so. But I guess theor theoretically you could. So this picture is a little bit blurry, and you're probably saying, well, why didn't you get a better one? Because I really wanted to show how it looks laid out on a drive when we're talking about these logical partitions. So here, the first partition that you see is a primary partition, and that partition is where the system is booting from. And then we have an extended partition below that, and then three partitions that represent the main operating system and then later on where the home directory lives later uh, you know on down that's that's how that is a traditional way of setting up the old MBR systems for Linux now these days we usually just skip the boot partition we don't need that in an MBR setup but in EFI if you're using the GPT partition table then you're gonna have a little boot sector and that's your EFI boot sector and it has to be there GPT is an update on the partitioning tables it works differently and there is no concept of primary or logical partitions so you can have as many partitions as you want on a drive and that's nice when you're dealing with really large hard drives and you might want to cut them up into little spaces or big raid arrays that you want to have different partitions represented in so it's important to understand that so within each partition we think of that as a device in and of itself and that is where we put file systems and yes, you can have different file systems on the same drive if you have two different partitions. For instance, one could be NTFS, which is the Windows native file system if you were booting Windows. And then the other one could be like EXT4 for Linux. And then, of course, also in Linux, we have the concept of a swap partition, which is just dedicated blank space for the kernel to use as a scratch area uh, when it runs out of physical memory keeps you from running out of physical memory. You do a little virtual memory there. So that's what that is. You also have swap files. You might be familiar with that in Windows and we have that concept now in Linux. It's always been there but now a, like Ubuntu ships instead of creating a swap partition by default it creates a swap file. That's another video all into itself. But these are the things that you would see if you would open up the editor and take a look there. So let's move on. We're going to talk about the EXT4 history, and we're going to uh, just go over this real quick here. The EXT file system was originally introduced to replace the Minix file system, which is what Linux originally shipped with when uh, Linus Torvalds released it in 1991. Linus was agog at the Minix flavor of Unix, and Minix was really cool. Back in those days, you could have mainframes, you could have mini computers, and then you could have uh, personal computers. And the Minix system was made to run on what were called mini computers. I worked at a company back 
uh, at that same time, when he was going to school writing Linux, I was working for a big radio station that had a mini computer. So they're just they covered a tabletop and then they would have some external hard drives and stuff like that and you'd get into it with terminals and that sort of thing ours did not run on minix it ran on a system called basis but linus was using minix and he wanted a version of that that not only could he run on a mini computer but he wanted to be able to run it on a personal computer and he wanted it to be open source because he didn't have any money <laughs> so when he wrote linux he borrowed the code from Minix for the file system. So obviously as Linux grew you would have to uh, come up with your own file system. Well EXT was the first attempt at that. There is not a whole lot of documentation about the original EXT. It was experimental and it was extremely unstable. However it was fixed and the next version was EXT2 and that was very successful and you can still format things to ext2 today like you could do usb sticks you could do your boot partition if you were doing an old ms dos boot and you're not using efi then you could use ext2 uh, i think for you have to use like fat32 or vfat if it's going to be uh the um, new uefi boot so no EXT2 on a UEFI enabled computer. Then we had EXT3 come along and the main reason that EXT3 was developed from what I read is to make running the file system checker a whole lot faster. So when your computer boots up and you have EXT4 it automatically scans all of the EXT4 file systems that are mounted at startup. So if you have two partitions one of them has your OS in it, so that would be your root partition, and the other one would be your home partition that has all your user data in it. It's going to scan those. It'll do the root partition first because that's the boot, and then it'll do that, and it'll look for problems and issues. And in EXT2, if it came across a problem, like let's say that you had a hard crash and you're restarting the computer and you didn't get files written that were in the cache, then it would have to scan through that entire system and when it found those not quite right entries into the system it would take forever to scan through everything to find out what was going on so what they did was with the xt3 is they added journaling which basically adds an extra step to the write process your computer tries to hold on to information for as long as possible in memory before writing it to block storage devices to drives and the reason why it does that is because they are slow even modern ssds are slower than your memory in your computer and so there is a cache and when you have data that needs to go out to those devices it hangs on to it a little bit and it waits for a little downtime and it puts it in there in the right order to ma maximize efficiency and all that kind of stuff and what happens is is that when your computer for some reason uh, stops working immediately you kick the power cord out and you don't have a UPS or your laptop locks up even though it's got a battery or even if you have a UPS on your computer you could still have a hard lockup all of that stuff that's sitting in the cache goes away well with journaling it has written that there was this stuff sitting in cache that needed to be written later but it was waiting for a call and if it doesn't get the call to sync that and to take what's in the journal and put it into the main file system, then you're going to have an inconsistency at boot up. However, because we have that little delay and we're writing to the journal first, the file, file system checker, FSCK, it knows immediately, okay, that didn't get written to disk, don't worry about, dump it. And it rolls back the journal to the last known good state. And it'll tell you, you can see them, you know, it'll say, inode blocks whatever dumped or whatever the deal is you'll get a message when the computer boots back up but it only takes like seconds with you with a journaling file system whereas with the ext2 system it'll take some time i experimented with ext2 years ago and created that exact thing and it does take it quite a while it could take several minutes for it to crunch through the entire ext2 system looking for the error so you can imagine what that would be like on a really large system with a lot of storage devices 
So EXT3 was definitely a step in the right direction. It was more secure than EXT2 as far as your data. It was very reliable. And then in 2006, there was an upgrade to that, and that's EXT4. That is the file system that we are still running now on most Linux systems, and it's just gotten regular maintenance and through the years. The fellow who actually maintains EXT4 is named Ted So, and he considers it to be some sort of an interim file system before we get to more advanced file systems and he's been saying that for years but we've now we've what almost uh, 14 years since ext4 well 14 years since ext4 was introduced we're still running it on most linux systems so that tells you how good it is and the big changes from ext3 to ext4 were just reliability and greater capacity and the other thing that they did was is they switched from addressing fixed block sizes on a drive to addressing what are known as extents, which is a way to just say this file takes up the block space on the drive from here to here and it doesn't have a fixed number to it. In other words, you don't have to say it's a bunch of four kilobyte blocks and have that number for it. You could say, no, it's just from here to here. And that'll make more sense uh, as we move on here. It'll make more sense. So what's really cool about EXT2, EXT3, and EXT4 is that they are inter intercompatible and you can read them and write them. And you can take an EXT2 file system and with just a command in place, you can upgrade it to EXT3 by adding the journal. And then you can upgrade EXT3 to EXT4. And it's also backwards compatible where you can take EXT4 and you can mount it as EXT3 if you're working on some old ancient legacy system that can only read ext3 it can be backwardly mounted to ext4 you lose some of the functionality but it works i'm not quite sure the situation in which you'd have to do that but that's what it says in the documentation is that you can do that so that's where ext4 came from so let's talk a little bit about how ext4 stores data we are actually looking at an ext2 graphic here this is because uh, ext4 is a bit more complicated we're not showing where the journal is or any of that sort of thing the journal by the way lives out in the data blocks for people who want to know it's just a kind of an internal file system that is maintained by the file system and it it stores that information about rights and that's where it goes so the first thing that you're going to see on here is the super block and that is an area on the drive at the very front that contains information about the file system. This tells the kernel exactly where everything is and how to address things. And then the next thing that you're going to see is uh, the group descriptors, which just talk about groups of blocks of data on the drive. The next one is we have reserved group descriptor space. Uh, that's for extra copies of the group descriptors and then we have the block bitmap and the inode bitmap the block bitmap is how the available space is mapped out in logical blocks on the drive so let's say that each block is four kilobytes and we have divided up whatever space is available on the drive after all of the metadata that we're looking at up front here and what it does is uh, in a bitmap it's a bunch of bits it's what it is so each block is represented by a bit and if that bit is flipped to on or one that means that block is being used if it is flipped to zero that would mean that that block is not being used and that's how that works for both the block table and the inode table so that's how ext4 keeps up with what is where on your hard drive that's how it knows. And then we have the inode table itself, which is where information about the files are stored. We're going to look at that in a couple of minutes. So if you're starting to scratch your head, just calm down, wait a few minutes. We're going to get right into it. Before that, we want to talk a little bit about the super block. And I want to show you some of the information that's in the super block. 
As you can imagine, with a name like Superblock, it's very important. When the file system is created, several backups are made of the Superblock. So if you ever run into a very rare occurrence where your Superblock becomes compromised, you can actually save the file system by grabbing one of those backups and copying it into the main Superblock space, and then the file system will become accessible again. And there's, there's a way to do that. Most of us will never run into that situation because having a corrupt superblock is a very rare thing. And most of us will just go, oh, let me reformat that and start over. Thank you. I will restore from a backup because you should be keeping backups at all times. You know that, don't you? But anyway, let's take a look at what's in the superblock. And you can use a command called dump e2fs to put that in a file and save it somewhere else. Or you can just look at what's in it. Now in this case we're only going to look at the first 30 lines because the super block has a lot of information in it but you'd be surprised how humanly readable it actually is. It's, this is pretty cool stuff right here. So let me go ahead and put my password in and we are looking at the super block for the root directory on this machine. This is the main uh, where the OS lives and so you can see that I have named that file system root when I set it up using gparted and it says it was last mounted at uh, root and then you got the uh, U UUID which is the universal ID there and the, the magic number that goes I don't know what that is exactly but it's, I, like I said file systems are deep they go on and on and it says it has a journal and this is all of the attributes of the system what file system features are turned on so that's what that is right there. And it said that the last known state of this file system, even though it's running this computer right now, it is considered to be clean. And it says that the OS type is Linux and that the error behavior is just continue. Even if you have an error, don't shut down. So yeah, a lot of this is humanly readable information that you can actually understand. So there's the timestamp right there for the last time it was mounted, the last time it was written to. And uh, you notice that when we're looking at these timestamps, that we have those extra numbers. You can, you can see the time there, but then there's those extra numbers next to it. That's because the, the timestamps are actually extremely accurate. So that's about enough about the super block. You can take a look at that yourself. It actually puts out a lot of output. I just looked at the first 30 lines uh, for that one. So let's talk about inodes because they're actually more interesting than super blocks or uh, the uh, group descriptors uh, and they really get into the nitty gritty of actually what a file is on a Linux system. So an inode is a data structure on a file system on Linux and other Unix like operating systems that stores all the information about a file except its name and its actual data. So after I read that, you're probably saying to yourself, well, I understand that the data is going to go in the data pool, but where's the name? The name is in the directory. So on file systems, you'll notice that the root directory never has a name. It's just represented by a slash. And the reason why is, is that that would be the master inode. That's the first inode is the root directory of the file system. That's the base of the tree where everything comes off of it, right? And so it can't have a name because nothing describes that directory or that particular well it is a directory so nothing describes it it's just an inode and then we start from there directories that come under that now they are nothing more than lists of file names that are in that directory that's all it is so that's where the file name is actually stored in the directory itself so if you create a file in the root directory then the file name goes in the root directory which points at an inode and the inode then points to some amount of data out in the data pool. EXT file systems have a fixed number of inodes and you can run into a theoretical problem where if you had a really large EXT file system and you had a whole bunch of little files with not much data in them you could have a situation where you could run out of inodes before you ran out of actual data space on the drive. The chances of that happening on your laptop or desktop or even your server are very 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 low. <laughs> that would have to be a very edge case type situation. So uh, 
I don't really know if you can add inodes, or I guess you just have no choice but to make the system bigger. That's a good, that's something to look up <laughs> and go after, but it is an interesting little factoid there is that you can run out of inodes. So let's take a look at what's in an inode. And an inode contains a lot of information about a file. It has the access time on the file. It has who owns it. It has the permissions for that file in there. And then it has the links to the uh, data itself. And to make it so that you can have really large files on your computer, you have the direct links to the data pool, which work up to a certain size. And then we have indirect, then double indirect, and then triple indirect. So you can have huge files with ext4. I believe the limit is 16 terabytes on a single file. Now other file systems have limits beyond that at this point, but 16 terabytes, that's a big damn file and it works nicely for most people who are using Linux. I don't see that as being any sort of a, a problem at this point. And of course, if you did run into a situation where you needed a file that was more than 16 terabytes, I guess you could move on to a more advanced file system and it would be okay. So looking at that that looks you know, this is really the best graphic that i could find that explained what was in there but what we really ought to do is jump over here like this and let's go find an actual file and take a look at it so i'm going to go into my downloads directory and then i'm going to go into uh, let's look at packages no no i know what i want to do iso all right so let's list the files in here. You see I've got a bunch of ISO files. These are installation files for Linux operating systems. Linux Mint and a whole different bunch of versions of Ubuntu, right? So you're probably familiar with getting information about the file by using the uh, long format. And that gives you the permissions and the file names and the timestamps and all that other stuff. Well, you can actually get some more information about it by adding i to that and now you see we've got this number up front before we get to the permissions right here on each one of these file listings and that is the inode number of the file so that's the actual where it's at in the inode table so that's kind of cool to be able to do that uh, it I don't really know how useful that is, but I'm just showing that you can actually get that number. I guess it would help because if it's a real low inode number, you'd know that it was added very early in the file system or whatever. I have no idea, but it's there. Okay. So let me go ahead and clear the screen. I'm using control L to do that. Let's actually look at an inode and see the information in it for a real file. And we're going to use the stat command to do that. And then I guess we'll do it with Linux Mint. So now we are looking at all of the information stored in the inode, including the inode number for that file. And at first it gives us the, the, the size, how many blocks it takes up. Um, it shows that it's a regular file, what device it's on. Here's the inode number, how many links to that file. That's important because we can have more than one link to a file. So you can have a pool of data that has more than one link to it and actually has more than one inode. So what happens in that situation is that um, the file has two different names, but it's still the same file. And that is extremely useful when you have to have a file appear somewhere else in the file system, but you want it to be the same file. And you can have a lot of links to a file. By the way, when you delete something in Unix and Linux, what you actually do is you remove all the links. Once you get to a place where there are no links to the file, there are no inodes describing it, then basically the data just goes away. It's still sitting on the hard drive, but there's no way to get to it. So sometimes in really old literature talking about Linux file systems and Unix, you will hear this uh, unlinking, and that's what they're talking about. 
Also, when you're running a file, when a file has a handle to it uh, that's saying that it's open, that's considered to be a link as well. So you could have a situation where you delete a file that's open, but it doesn't really disappear until you close the program, uh, which is how updates used to work, at least. I'm not sure if that's how they work today, but in older Unix systems, you could update a running program in place because you would change the inode, but the data would still be open. Now, whether it works that way today, I'm not really sure. I'm getting a little over my head on that one. I'd have to do some more deep research. But that's why you can have your web browser open. There's some mechanism there where you can change the data on the hard drive, but the, the browser is still running from the old data or else it would crash, you know, that sort of thing. You'll notice here that the timestamps are very, very precise. And that is for scientific applications where you need to know exactly the difference between the time that file was accessed or modified or changed. So that's what that is. And that's pretty much all the information in inodes. It does show you the permissions set on the file. It shows you the user. And as far as the operating system is concerned, I'm not Joe. It's showing it here, but it's just doing that as a courtesy for us human beings. As far as the OS is concerned, we're all numbers. So if you are the main first uh, person on an Ubuntu system that has sudo privileges, guess what? You're user 1000 usually. That's how that works. Okay. That's enough about inodes. So let's talk about working with ext4. Uh, one of the first commands that you can use is sync. And you might think, well, what is that going to do me any useful good? Well, the sync command, um, it forces the system to write all of the data that's sitting in the cache to all the drives that are mounted to it at that moment. So if you have a bunch of USB devices plugged in or you're intending to you know, pull one out and you're not really sure if you can uh, what you safely remove the drive, you know, click that, eject it, or whatever. Just sync it. And that will force it to write. And that happens with your hard drives too. If for some reason you think that there is the possibility that the power is going to go out in the next minute and you want to make sure that your project is written thus far, then sync the drives. So it's a really super simple command. I'm going to show you, but it's there's not much to see. It doesn't really give you any output. It just does it. Sync. That's it. So all of that stuff's written back there. So I at least wanted to tell you about that. All right. The other command that you can use is fsck. And you have to have that running on a, a file system that's not currently mounted. So if you wanted to fsck your main root partition and your home partition, let's say, you really can't have them mounted and do that. That would corrupt the file system so you have to unmount them first that's why it's done automatically at boot so we're going to do it on a drive that I have mounted to the system that isn't currently uh, I have plugged in but it's not mounted let's put it that way so we will find out where our drive is and you can see that I have a drive that's plugged in at SDB and there is a partition on it that's SDB1 and that is an ext4 partition so if we wanted to check that then what we would do is we would type in sudo fsck and then we have to tell it exactly where the drive is so we will use dev and then the drive is sdb partition one so this should work and it's going out and it's checking the drive right now. It's doing it. And it says that the drive is completely clean. As a matter of fact, that's my backup drive. So if you use the BU script, you know exactly what that is. And it gives me some basic information about it. That drive is OK. If I had any questions about that, like that is a USB drive, if I had unplugged it before the computer shut down, thought maybe there might be some corruption in the file system, that's how I would know. So that's what that does. All right. The next one that I want to talk about is Tune2FS. And Tune2FS is a very powerful command that is used to tweak the file system 
parameters and the main reason that I use it is to adjust the reserved space in an ext4 file system when an ext4 file system is set up 5% of the data blocks are set aside for use by the Linux kernel and the reason why that is done is that if you ever run into a situation where a program goes crazy and fills up your entire root partition you can run into a situation where you don't have room for commands to run and it will lock the system up so what ext4 does is it automatically sets aside five percent now if you're dealing with a very large hard drive five percent is a lot of space and so you may want to either tweak that and give it less space let's say like one percent or you may want to give it zero percent so let's run a tune 2 fs command and we'll do it here on this same drive that we were just working at so it's sudo tune 2 fs and we're going to do the option m which works on the uh, reserve space and i'm going to set it to zero because this drive will never did I hit an O instead of a zero? I think I did. Yes, I did. It wouldn't have worked, would it? Anyway, the uh, problem here is that this particular drive is never going to be called upon to run a program from. It will never be in a situation where if it does run out of space that it will hinder the operation of the system. So there's no reason to set that aside so I can set it for zero. If this was a root partition that booted, and it's a large one, it's 500 gigabytes, I could reset this to 1%, which is plenty of space for the kernel to work with if it has to create here documents, opening up things like that. That's what it's used for. It's, it's, the kernel does access the drive to do different things, and that's why it needs to be there. So now we need to tell it exactly what drive we're working with. That would be SDB, and it would be partition one. And so it'll go off and it'll set this. All right, and there it goes. It said that it's setting, it set the reserve blocks percentage to zero, and it did that in the super block. So now, when this file system is mounted, this it just automatically knows that that's what it's going to do. Okay, so the last one we want to talk about is E4 defrag, and what that does is it's your def file defragmenter on spinning drives on ext4 and i know some of you out there are going wait wait a minute i've heard i don't have to defragment my file system on linux and the truth is you don't because the ext4 file system the way it lays things out uh, in the data field the, the part of the drive there it tries to create enough space between files that they have room to grow so that you don't have file fragmentation because what can happen is that as you create files, delete files, and then create files again, those blocks can be non-contiguous. Remember, it's just looking for enough space to store all the data. So over time, you might have a little bit of data here and a little bit of data there and a little bit of data here. And of course, that slows down the performance of the drive, especially on spinning drives. And yes, it can actually have an effect on the performance of a SSD drive because you still have all of these different addresses that it has to go to. Of course, it's much less of an effect than it is on a spinning drive where you actually have a physical head that's moving around. So uh, that is what uh, the defragmenter does. And I'll show you how that works. It, if you, you don't run this command on SSDs, the system probably will not let you do it. So, I mean, I can show you sudo e4 defrag, and I just want it to check, and then I'm going to tell it to do the root file system. Uh, guess what? It ain't going to do it. Well, actually, it's it seems to be trying to check it. This is unusual behavior. It is checking the root file system on this computer and making a liar out of me. But it should come back and say that you shouldn't actually ever do this uh, to uh, an SSD. Because <laughs> usually that's what it does. It says that you can't do it. Hold on, I'm going to pause this thing and let it finish and see what we come up with. Well, it actually did give me a fragmentation report for the first uh, partition on my SSD. 
and it says that it is not defrag it's not fragmented at all the fragmentation score is zero and it does tell me that the average extent size those are uh, how big the data blocks are is 54 kilobytes so there you go um, so uh, if you were going, I don't know, well, I'm not going to try and defragment my drive in case there's some reason why it shouldn't do that. It shouldn't let me. Oh, I can stop it if it tries. Let's see what it does. Because some of you are out there going, do it, do it, do it. I can hear you. So let's see if it'll actually defragment that drive. Yes. Um, well, it's it seems to be doing it. And we don't need to do that because that's an SSD. <laughs> in past versions, it says... Uh, it has told me not to be able to do that, but it's it's letting me defragment an SSD. Okay, that's a first. Learn something new, because I was about to tell you guys that it wouldn't let you do it, and it did. So that's how the defragger works. I won't do it on the other drive then, because I was going to mount up the backup drive and run a defragmentation, but I'm not going to do that. So that is pretty much all I have to say about uh, working with EXT4. One little factoid that probably has occurred to you when we were talking about inodes was what happens if you have a file that doesn't have anything in it or it only has a couple of characters and there are some configuration files on the system that do just that well ext4 is very smart and what it does is it doesn't go out and ask for a data block to be reserved for that it'll take that and put it in the inode itself and that concept is called inlining and there are many files I don't know how much information you can cram into an inode data wise for a file but suffice it to say that if you had a file with just one or two lines in it it's probably not actually out in the data pool it's probably in the inode itself so it's being stored within the inode table it would have to be a very small amount of data because inodes themselves are 256 kilobits so it would have to be way below that but I'm sure there are many files that are stored that way and those files are super fast access on even a spinning drive simply because of the fact that it doesn't have to go read the data because what happens now is if you're accessing a file with ext4 it has to go look it up in the inode it goes and finds that information and then it goes out and it looks for that um, so as you use it, a lot of that information, your inode information, gets cached. If it's a file that you're constantly going after, that's sitting in read cache, and it's not going to the drive every time. That should be pretty obvious. So that's about all I wanted to say, other than uh, talking about other file systems versus ext4. I think you've got a pretty basic understanding of how it works. So let's talk about some of these other systems that uh, you'll hear about. The first one on the list is XFS, which is probably the most deeply integrated file system that is not the Linux native file system, EXT4. It's to a point now where it could almost be considered Linux native, although it comes to us uh, from the um, CGI company for their old system called Erix. Now, CGI developed the... Uh, XFS system to store very large image files so it's extremely good at working with large files and if you have a server that has large SQL databases XFS is a good way to go now it also has multi-thread access which means that it can have many handles open to the same file at the same time and other handles on the system so that means that you get a little bit more uh, a little quicker response time when you're writing to make large files in particular that's what it's designed to do now the downsides to XFS in my experimentation with it is number one that it uses more CPU than ext4 ext4 you can have it doing a defragmentation thing at or whatever it can be doing that and it uh, doesn't use very much CPU at all. It's very low level in the system. Whereas if you were doing something like that with uh, XFS, and there is a way to do that because there's a command that you do use to reorganize the file system in XFS, so it is a, analogous to defrag, you'd see your CPUs going crazy on that. So on a small system, XFS 
the advantages that you get from the multi-threaded access and its ability to work quickly with large files they're kind of offset by the fact that you're taking up resources to run the file system that could be given to a program. Uh, the other problem with XFS is that it does not recover as gracefully from crashes as EXT4 and it doesn't automatically check itself when it boots up in most Linux distributions. Now some Linux distributions are shipping with XFS as the home directory or even the, the root directory and I'm sure that those systems have the calls to check them at uh, startup. But usually with XFS if you're suspicious that there's something wrong with the file system you will have to unmount it first then you will have to run the repair tool to check it and make sure that it's okay and in the case of a root partition where you're actually booting off of XFS that would mean booting the system off of some boot device and putting it in a live environment let's say and then running those tools from there to make sure that the root file system was okay so I there are some distributions of Linux that are shipping it and um, let's see OpenSUSE is using it for the home partition and so is Fedora so people are using it BTRFS uh, this is a next generation file system which is actually Linux's response to something like a ZFS which is a little further down the list there and uh, it is a volume manager and a file system all in one thus far we've talked about setting up simple partition tables on drives well a volume manager is a piece of software that can span file systems across several physical devices and with BTRFS or ButterFS as it's known that is all integrated into one place so you can set up mount points for different data pools that run across different uh, drives and it really adds an extra layer of obfuscation from the physical stuff now uh, it offers advanced features probably its best one would be snapshots which means that you can fix a moment in time and it will hang on to the data that is in the file system at that moment and as you add data to it 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 never actually erases the old data and that might sound like that it takes up a lot of space but really it doesn't and so you can have several of these snapshots and then be able to roll back to them at any time in other words if you screw something up you could just roll back to the old snapshot so if you have Linux Mint then you're probably used to time shift which is what they use for their system snapshot or and you can roll that back well if you have butterfs on your root partition time shift will use those snapshots and it's pretty cool now the downside to all of this is that it is slower on most equipment if you have like a regular laptop or a regular uh, computer then what you're going to end up with is a situation with like if you have a single drive in it you're going to notice this is going to be slower than running ext4 or xfs because you have the overhead of the volume manager and plus it's the way that uh, B btrfs works the other problem with btrfx fs is fragmentation it's ha it doesn't use inodes the same way that ext4 does and it tends to fragment itself very quickly uh, it is considered at this point to be somewhat experimental and there are still persistent issues with ButterFS that haven't made it go completely mainstream although OpenSUSE is shipping with ButterFS on the root partition and I don't hear a lot from that community about problems with it so I'm not really sure but my main issue with it is the fact that it has a lot of features that I wouldn't use and it's a bit difficult to set up and understand the the, the setup and um, it's just a bit too advanced I think for a desktop or a laptop with a single hard drive in it most people don't need that or understand how to use it so ZFS is pretty much the same thing it's like ButterFS but it is not Linux native it is a Unix native file system and there are licensing issues that keep it out of the mainline Linux kernel however XFS or excuse me rather ZFS has been around for a long time and it's considered to be more stable than ButterFS 
and there are a lot of people who would like to have it available in the mainline kernel. Ubuntu, with their latest interim release, was experimenting with booting with uh, ZFS, and it worked. I tried it, but once again, you're dealing with a feature-heavy file system that is all command line driven and uh, it actually runs slower than good old ext4 so i didn't keep it around i just played with it now one you'll see that'll pop up is uh, jfs which is a legacy 64-bit bit file system from ibm and this goes back to the uh, unix days once again this works in linux it's available i don't know anybody that uses it i don't know why anybody would choose to use it as far as I know, it's a rather limited system. I don't know a great deal about it, to tell you the truth, but it is something that you see offered along with these other systems. And then finally, we need to talk about NTFS. Now, you're not going to see this offered at a Linux install, but you can open up something like Gparted, and you can add an NTFS partition to your drives. And this is the Windows native file system. And the main thing to keep in mind when working with it in Linux is that it is really a convenience that you can read and write to it. The file permission structure is not exactly the same. So Linux looks at any NTFS system and just gives you access to all the files straight up. You can, in other words, you could boot a Linux system up and then put your Windows boot drive on it that has the system on it and look at all the files and delete anything on there you wanted to and cripple Windows super easy but this is also why people who are trying to troubleshoot Windows systems or clean viruses out of them like doing that is because basically the file permissions for Windows don't apply in Linux and they can go and find these nasty files and root kits and whatever and get them off the system if you are running an environment where you have Windows and Linux together and you have NTFS partitions that Linux is going to access, it's really a good idea to have it where you can fix NTFS with Windows. NTFS is a crappy file system and it breaks itself over time. You don't even have to do a lot to it. Just run it. Just read and write a few files to it and it starts having issues. In a Windows environment, you run check disk and Windows does that in the background all the time just like Linux does and it looks for problems and it fixes it the problem is is that Linux really truthfully cannot fix NTFS problems you really need to do it from Windows to maintain a healthy NTFS partition NTFS also sucks because it fragments itself really badly over time. That's why most Windows systems have it set up where once a week it's going to try and do a defrag on that and uh, it will uh, defragment the system automatically in the background because it has to be and the more stuff you have on an NTFS uh, file partition the the um, uh, the slower it gets because of that fragmentation. As we mentioned before Linux is usually pretty good about not fragmenting on the on, even on XFS and the only time that you should ever even consider defragmenting a Linux system is if let's say you have a drive that's full of huge video files that are highly fragmented and it's filling up more than 70 percent of the drive you might want to do that and you might see in that case a slight improvement in performance but um, a lot of people who come from Windows they're kind of they're like, well, I should defragment my drive all the time. No, don't do that. You don't need to do that in Linux. In Windows, yeah, once a week you need to do it or the system slows down. So that's it, gang. That's my look at EXT4 and my opinions on other file systems. Uh, for right now, I think that EXT4 is the way to go, especially for regular old desktops and laptops. If you need something that is more sophisticated than that then you might want to look into playing around with LVM and then using XFS or EXT4 on top of that LVM is the Linux volume manager and that allows you to do a lot of spanning across drives and things like that I don't recommend LVM for anybody who doesn't understand exactly how it works and as far as ButterFS is concerned and uh, ZFS I think that they need to cook a little bit longer in Linux before they're going to become the defaults anywhere and um, 
those systems are usually very useful to people who know how to get the most out of them. We're talking about real file storage geeks out there. For the average user, eh, that snapshot feature is nice, but you can do that with rsync. It's not that big a deal, and uh, you can live without it for now. So that's where we are in the state of Linux file systems. Your feedback is always welcome, and you can check out the, dis the uh, links in the description of the video. I'll get it out sooner or later. My mouth doesn't want to work. And you can check out Easy Linux on the web. And you can also check out our Facebook page if you're a Facebook user. Give it a like if you would. And if you want to, join the community at Easy Talk. It's our forum. And it's free, secure, and a lot of fun, too. So you can check that out as well. We'll do it again soon. Thanks for watching.